Next two pieces I'll be making are items 10 and 11. This is the eccentric and the cap for the eccentric. This is the unit that holds the valve, goes over top of the eccentric hub, and is responsible for cycling the pressure back and forth in the cylinder. When you get this part, it looks exactly like this. It's got some nasty parting line stuff on it. I've already hit it with a file to see what type of mismatch we're dealing with, and it's actually not that bad. This part is relatively clean. Watch this. Ba -ba. There you go. That's better. Going to take a file to the inside, get some of the ugly off the inside, and then we're going to figure out an approach to do this. This is one of the components for the opposite end of the cylinder that guides the rod that this actually drives, I believe. It will be cut off right here, and it will be ultimately split, so it's two pieces. And an easy way to determine how much material you have to work with when you have something like this is to measure it inside across the long dimension, measure it across the short dimension, and then subtract the short dimension from the long dimension. That will give you what the engineer was thinking about when he made this pattern to pour this component. All right, long dimension minus the short dimension gives you how much room you have to work with right here. It shouldn't be a very big deal. It says eighth inch on the print. And if it says an eighth of an inch and you want a symmetrical part, chances are you're going to use an eighth of an inch. So let's file this down. Let's take the measurements and see what the calculations work out to. And I'm going to approach this in a very different manner just because I think there's enough uh, material here to do it. I think you're going to like what you see. Stick around. After a couple of minutes with a file, taking off of the flash lines. Now this is not cosmetically finished. This is just taking off the flash lines. I spent a little extra time on the outside for two reasons. It's going to be a highly visible surface for one, and for two, it's going to be my initial approach surface. Now let's talk about how much we have to block off of here. I'm going to show you a real quick, easy way to do that. If you have something like this, it's going to come and turn into two pieces. Well, let's use a digital caliper. Go across the center first. Get it to, let's see, all right. 862. Zero it out. I'll measure it long ways. Boom. There you go. That's the anticipated engineered design intent split gap. 120. I think on the print. Let's see what it says on the print. Pretty sure it says 1 8. Yes, it does. 1 8. 1 8 in Imperial, 125. That's about 3 millimeters. So that falls right in line with what they recommend on the print, and that's the easy way to do that. First thing I'm going to do on this part is I'm going to establish the thickness, both sides. And when I filed this, let's zoom out. I didn't separate it from the other part, because it makes a real nice little lollipop that you can hold, flip it around, access the part as you see fit. It's a real handy thing to have, so don't saw it off until you absolutely have to. Now, like I did on the rod component, I may leave some part of this gate on there and just square it off for now. The surfaces that will be machined and will be drilled have not been addressed. Why bother? You're going to cut them anyway. I think you're going to like the approach on this, and I know I'm going to get a ton of questions. So let's uh, get over to the mill and make it happen. This is a very rigid setup. I am not squeezing this very hard for sake of not wanting to distort the profile. Come down on that with a small cutter and dust it off. I'm going to take about 10 off of each side and see what I get.
Took about five thousandths before that cleaned up, so that gives me a pretty good indication that the outside ears are somewhat symmetrical. If there is any deviation, and this is sitting in there at an angle, I want to make sure that I maintain the angle the exact same way when I flip it. So I'm going to take the front, put the front to the back, put the back to the front, and face it, and let's see how parallel it is after that. Personally, I like this setup. I like it a lot. You know, if it works, it'll be even better. I'll jiggle it around so it seats. Boy, that seat's in here really nice. Without moving the table, let's take a clean up pass, see what it does. <laughs> It's about 297 and a half. About 297 and a half. A couple of tenths under at 297 and a half. 297 too. This is absolutely beautiful. Within three or four tenths, holding it by the ears. I'll make sure that if you flip it. And it's sitting at an angle. Don't flip it this way, because you'll just compound that problem. Make sure you continue to flip it this way so it banks on the same spots. I like the way it looks. I'm going to give it a visual for central alignment. See which side needs to be addressed a little bit more. And we'll come back and finish it off. 23 and a half coming off of each side. Let's do it. This is the point where you check this part for thickness, make sure it conforms to the print. I am going to face off this nub on this end in this setup, and I'm going to clean off the gate in the back. Clean it up, not clean it off. Let's get some square surfaces on here we can bank from. Prince calling for 250. We are sitting on. Dude, we couldn't be being much closer than that. 249.8, 249.9. Let's figure out a way we're going to split this thing where we need to split it. Get that done. First thing I'm going to do is center the cutter in this particular oblong pocket. I'm going to visually line it up on the x-axis, which is left to right the way it's sitting here. I'm going to visually line it up, centered. I'm going to touch the back, watch for the dust to fall, touch the front, wait for the dust to fall, and then I'm going to split that value and get back to center. I'm going to do the exact same thing on the x and come up with a starting zero, which is mid-bore, center of the split line. 
from this point on I'm going to step off and I'm going to dust this cap on the back that gives me a very good indication of where this reference surface is to where I need to split. If you watch the uh, crankshaft rod video, you, connecting rod video, excuse me, if you watch the connecting rod video you'll know that that's a very useful surface to have for later operations. And I will probably do the same thing for the front. Let's do it. If you have a center line feature on your digital, now is the time to use it. Drop this down in the pocket, move to the back, zero your digital, move to the front. When you make contact, hit the little CL button on your digital and that will give you how far you have to crank to get back to the center of the two reference points. That's exactly how I'm going to do this. You can see that the track mark in the back is extremely superficial, as is the one on the y-axis. Now, as I measured it before, the one-inch diameter that I'll be looking to finish, I knew I had plenty of material to do this, and this is far enough away from the final diameter that I can get away with a small dig. I am going to write my 00, zero number right on my clean vise, and I'm going to move off and I'm going to dust each end of this part, recording the number. subtracting the radius of the cutter and I will know exactly how far from the split line to each end I have. At that point I can either slit it with a saw or lay it out and cut it with a hacksaw. It doesn't matter. Those surfaces will be machined anyway. Let's do it. Once I established the X and Y in the center of the part, I made sure that my digital was reading zero. I stepped off to the right on the X axis, cleaned it up at 956 and a half. Did the exact same thing on the left hand side, cleaned it up at 1 inch 096 and a half. Now I did the 6 and a half for a very specific reason. This is a 312 diameter cutter. So half of 312 is 156. So I know that by leaving a 6 on the end of each one of the values that I came up with, or that I intentionally hit, that it should be an easy number to work with. I'm going to pop it out, put it on the bench, figure out what that split line is, and show you how to lay it out. Once you know what the dimension is to find center, grab a gauge block or a piece of scrap, stand your part up, clamp a parallel across it, and once you remove the gauge block, the edge of the parallel is now a perfect scribe center that you can cut on. It's also good for reference for setting drill depths or anything else. And I think you can see by the camera angle that that parallel falls right across the small flat in the center of the part. So by putting this across a bandsaw on that line, if the saw does not cut wider than an eighth of an inch, well if it does get a new saw, so if it doesn't cut wider than an eighth of an inch you're in good shape and then all you need to do is join the two halves and bore the center out once you've decked off those two saw cut surfaces. Right, mine worked out to 800, yours may work out to something different, but this is a good solid technique for scribing a line. And if you want to scribe boundaries, then subtract the width of the gap from each one of the lines. And I'm saying if this was an eighth of an inch allowable gap, then that block right there should be a sixteenth of an inch short for the first line and a sixteenth of an inch tall for the second line. That way you'd have a boundary to cut between. I'm going to scribe it, then I'm going to do all the drilling, then I'm going to cut it and mill it and finish it. Let's do it. That particular setup will give you a great reference point to pass this across your saw. That's how it looks, that's how it's going to stay. I'm going to do the screws, I'm going to do the oiler and the link rod hole. 
first. Scribe line, courtesy of Randy Richard in the shop. Let's pick it this way. There you go. Randy Richard in the shop. I just love this thing. It's a great little scriber. If you don't have one, go over to his channel. Check it out. Holidays, buy someone you love a scriber. Free plug for Randy. Great tool. Thank you, Randy. All right, let's throw some chips. Next setup is straightforward. Using the pad that I milled in the last operation, I'm going to put that down right on top of the parallel in the vise. It will give me a nice flat vertical reference surface. I will clamp directly in the vise across those two surfaces. Use an edge finder coming in from the back and then visually align it side to side. This will be a multi-op part because I have to do the link rod here, the oiler, and then from the opposite end you do the clearance holes and the threads coming in from this side. And that is probably just because the oil cup is there and the head would be too tall for it if you came in from the front. So please don't make that mistake. Clearance holes on the opposite side of the oil cup, threads on the side facing the oil cup. Okay, I'm going to do this hole first. Keep that little nub, boy. Don't cut that nub off that casting. That is really a handy thing to have. Helps a lot. And just for yucks, scribe line out so you can see it. I know through the camera eye it's going to look like I am edge finding on the back of that boss. I am not. The edge finder will be down in this region down here on the back side of the part. Part is 250 thick. I'm going to set it 125 to center and visually line it up for that particular end feature. is centered up. I'm going to put the drill chuck in and we're going to find some reference points on the outside to see how close that is to center. First step in the assembly is to figure out some reference point as to exactly where you're at. If this were a critical solid rod that was driving directly into the valve through fixed points like the gland, the, the end of the cylinder, the way to do this would be to crack this part in half not crack it, saw it, machine it, whatever. Fit it back together, screws, everything, bore it, then put a pin in it, indicate either side of the pin to find your zero, and then find the center of the part and drill the hole. That is the only way you're going to guarantee that the center of this rod is in the center of that hole. But knowing that this controls linkage that goes through a U-joint, that U-joint is going to cure a lot of problems and absorb a lot of imperfections if you have any at that point. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to zero this out with my 250 pin against this boss. I'm going to move over. I'm going to visually check the gap against the side, visually check the gap against the side, and come up with something that I can trust. Right now I don't trust anything other than the fact that I know that that scribe line is perfect and it's 250 thick. That's about it. And that I'm 125 into the part, so center to center. Sometimes your eyes lie, let your fingers do the talking. I'm gonna zero it right where it is on the X. I'm just gonna move over and take a look. Okay, when in doubt, stick something to the back of your machine with a powerful magnet, and that gives you a great silhouette nice bright background for whatever you're trying to see 
and light that up instead of lighting up the part. And now you've got an incredible visual right through that crack. Nine ninety three and a half on one side. Nine eighty eight and a half on the other side. So that tells me I am ninety three eight five thousandths off, two and a half thousandths off. Let's go back to zero. Two and a half. Re zero your digital. Let's see if we can live with two and a half. Yep, we can. I can. And double check what we just did. Beauty. That is how I will do the center. That's how I'm going to do the drilling. And I am going to trust those numbers for what this feature is. That should be sufficient. Depending on how this turns out, I may or may not come back and split that. Don't know. We'll see. Stay tuned. You know, if you're a fan of videos like this, do yourself a favor and start paying attention to how smooth this body runs right here when someone runs a tap down into a part. It'll give you some idea of the integrity of the setup and the quality of the hole. take this piece out I'm going to remove the tap on the bench I just have a better feel when I can turn the part and the tap at the same time I'm going to put it right back in here basically in the same setup it is a much smaller land to locate on specifically the one where the tap is hanging out I'll line it up the same way on the X and we'll do the side holes I've got the part flipped over I have a little more exposure on this part just for this particular shot and you can see the benefit of lighting up behind your part when you're standing in front of it. I remember what the offset was in the first setup, and what I'm going to be looking for is the light to disappear right here. This is a great way to align the part vertically. I mean, you could use a 1, 2, 3 block, you could use a square, you could use a laser beam, I don't care what you use, but this, effort, this edge right here has been very instrumental in creating this part so far. So as you move your table ever so slowly in the x-axis, you want to see a nice even gap right there. And I am so pleased that the camera has still got that in focus. That is absolutely minimal. That will go away here in about the next two thousandths of an inch. You want to see the light close off completely top to bottom uniformly. And boy, that's about as uniform as it gets. And good night. Any deviation could be potential cast deviation or how you filed it, how you formed it, but you can see the light is completely gone. Once you have a zero reading on this side, same on the other side, split the difference. That'll put you in the middle 
and then you can come back and have a symmetrical pattern on either side. It's exactly what I'm going to do. There's no sense in showing it, but keep that in mind right there. Light up behind the part, look past the part, watch for the real bright gap to go away, and you know you're home. Good tip. Let's drill some holes. First step in the process, spot face where the screws are going to go, either side, 218 diameter. And once again, only time I'm going to put, a, and put an end mill in a drill chuck is for something just like this. Nice and easy. I will center drill these surfaces first in case this end mill is not a center cutting or doesn't want to cooperate as a center cut. With a center drill feature first, the end mill impact is minimal. The large body of the clearance drill I'm going to take right to that scribed line. Don't forget that is the center of the split line and there's a sixteenth of an inch on either side. So long as the large diameter of the clearance drill is anywhere within that one inch or one eighth zone, you're good to go. I'm going to move off on the Y axis and line it up that way. Sometimes you get lucky. Okay, machining tip. If you have not stoned the appropriate flat edge on the drill, the drill is going to want to dive. Do yourself a favor and keep a gentle drag on the quill or lock the quill and come up with the table. When it's just the edges of the drill catching like that, it has a tendency to want to pull. I can feel it in the handle. That's exactly what I'm doing. Lining up for the 256 oil cup feature that goes right here, I am going to use the same shadow technique that I used on the sides, but now I'm going to use the pad that I left on from the gate. I'm still on the y-axis zero for the center of the part. I'm simply going to squeeze these two and let these two come together and re-secure the vise. I'll get a little closer to keep the part in the middle of the vise. Back it off, watch the gap go away. And sunset, there you go. This is a visual alignment to the center of that remaining boss. I am going to do this exactly the same way I did the other holes. I'll spot face it first, drill it all the way through, and then 256 tap. It says to go an eighth of an inch deep, but I'm going to bury the tap because I want to sit on the cup and not the edge of the thread. If you don't use this shadow technique yet, you should do it. Because boy, I tell you, you can get stuff really close. Look at that. Love it. All right, let's drill a hole. 
when you drill a hole that's going to enter a bore on an incline like that on the slope or on the radius be very careful as you break through the drill is going to want it to deflect off the remaining material and could potentially grab and snap so be very gentle when you feel this thing starting to break through spot face first spot drill tap drill tap for the record. I do not have a breakout on the inside of that bore. The material on the inside of the casting still has yet to be removed and I'm going to keep my fingers crossed that we see a little bleed hole pop out when I remove that material. If not, uh, we'll figure it out at that time. center and threads. When I drilled the tap hole for this particular 256 thread going in there, I set my drill to the depth of the 540 cross hole that drives the valve rod. The valve rod is only going to be superficially into this and if this tapped drill hole goes all the way through to the center, this 540 pilot drill hole can be used as the bleeder for the journal. So if it doesn't break through the bore, at the very least, make sure it breaks through this hole here. I'm using my thumb wheel because the thumb wheel stays with the 256 for the build. The 540 gets the little tap handle. And I'm going to go down about a quarter of an inch at least. I get a lot better feel when I can turn the part and the tap. So knowing that this has got a good straight start, I'm going to pop it out right now. And I'm going to finish it with this in my left hand, turning this with my right hand. And we'll split it. All right, quickie little mid-run look at the part. 256 oil cup hole in, 540s on the side. Clearance on the side that does not have the oil cup. 540 link rod hole in. No penetration through to the inside yet, but this tap drill hole does go through to the bore. I'm going to split it right on that line. I'm going to put it on the bandsaw right now and cut it on that line. Then I'm going to register here and deck this to the height that I know the center is that I calculated initially. I'll put this piece in, I'll take a superficial cut and measure the stack height. The two numbers that I came with initially will give me a, a true center. At that point I can put it back in, screw it together, strap it down, which I will do to my little tooling plate, and I'll bore it. A couple minutes, let's finish. Now for everybody that's currently typing something that I should have marked it before I split it, I did that off camera. There is a split mark, or excuse me, there is a witness mark, the little punch mark right there. That will probably still stick around after this is cosmetically cleaned up, but that is my orientation mark for what side goes where. At this point it really doesn't matter, but once you've done it, depending on how bad or how good your parts are, it's always good to have a witness mark. 
put it in some place that it's really not obvious. Occasionally I'll use a small edge of a file and I'll put a nick in the part or a small punch mark somewhere where it shouldn't show up very bad. Alright, there you go. Not to worry. I'm going to sit it in the vise this way. I'm going to deck it off to exactly uh, 60 thousandths of an inch below each half value that I came up with before. You saw me set it up with the parallel and the gauge block. Well, this is where the rubber meets the road. I'm going to go 60 thou below the line, 60 thou above the line. And knowing those two numbers, I'll know how big this part should be to come up with a true split line in the center. Then I'll bore it. First half is set. I'm going to take a dust cut, measure it, come back and finish. And by set, I mean there is a parallel in the machine. Simply drop this in, put something thinner than the part in the middle of it. That'll give you a nice rock registration. Lock it down. Now dust it. Exact same procedure for this side. For the boring operation, I am back on my awesome little fixture plate that I've had since forever. I'm going to use that gate that I squared off in the very first operation. When you split these in half and you establish the size of the bottom, whatever you measured from here to that flat will be the offset on the y-axis. I'm standing behind the machine now and the front of the vise is that way. So whatever you picked up on, whatever you made that bottom half, that split line is easily located doing it exactly the way I'm doing it. Once I establish the center line, I'm going to jump into the center of the pocket and bounce back and forth off the sides. That is less important, but I will get a similar uh, central reading, and that's where I'll do my zero, 0 and bore this to one inch. I'll pick back up on the boring operation. There is, uh, well, I'll let it run, but we'll go fast forward on this. part is up on 8th inch aluminum shims so I can bore completely through it. I do plan to hit the shims on the first pass. And you want to be able to get all the way through without ruining your tooling. So that's the plan. Whatever height you set your boring head to initially, once you set all your stops and get your table all straightened out and dialed in, make sure you have enough room once you retract the boring bar to get your gauge under your bar. I see a lot of people make that mistake and it's like, oh, I got to move it off center to check the hole and then you move it back where you thought you were and you're not and you got a big problem. So make sure that this gap right here, when you're all ready to go and it's your stop is set and your retract is set, you can fit whatever gauge you're going to use in there. Ideal, but not always possible.
with the camera repositioned here you can see the oil hole the bleeder coming through from the oil cup is on this side back here and that is the feature that did not show up without the material being removed so if you're going to cheat on that hole cheat the hole towards center and with this thing successfully bored to one inch well, actually I'm going to finish boring it to one inch when it's successfully bored to one inch that'll be a little bit bigger so I'll set the camera right where it is and see if we can fast forward on this the battery just pooped on me uh, it actually didn't poop on me but it just pooped out so I do have a hard gauge for the one inch I'm going to sneak up on it, it might be a couple of tries so hang in there I'll fast forward through it Alright, if I was a bet man, I'm saying this gauge is going to go right in there. That's a beautiful thing. That is about a thou over if I had to just take an educated guess. You want it to be larger than not. It's got to fit that cam. Let's take it out, deburr it, see if it fits. Or just see how it fits, let's say that. Nice finish in there, I like it. All right, the moment of truth. Let's see if it fits on the eccentric cam. I have not tried it, I promise. I'm going to come around. Well, just... You have no idea what a pain in the neck it is. Just camera in your face. When you're done with this guy, make sure you break the inside edge right here. If there's any radius whatsoever on the cam, you want it to clear and not bind. So before you start thinking that's your bore, you can see how the oil feature broke through. That broke through perfectly. I'm really pleased with that. Looks like the picture. Try doing this looking through a viewfinder. No, there's really no reason to be gingerly approaching this, torquing this down. It's either right or it's not. If it's good, it doesn't matter how which side gets torqued first, make sure they are on the same plane. Press them both to one side of the cam. Oh, that's a beautiful thing right there. I like it. Well, we are definitely getting close. Let's go grab an oil cup and see what that looks like assembled. Okay, this top hole is an oiler hole. And if you're new to this build, I did make these as well. There's a video on how these were done. That is one tiny little piece. If you bought this kit, when you opened up the kit and saw the material that this comes from, you know how small they are. Oh, uh, yeah. Look at that. That is a beautiful thing. I wish I had the crank so that I could show you the function, but you've probably already seen that. You know, and in the interest of everybody walking away with information that is true and correct and accurate, it is 100% possible to part off across an interrupted hole. You do not have to worry 100% uh, of the time that the tool is going to bind and break off quote unquote it can be done go look at my video on how I made this one people do it all the time uh, it's no different than starting a part on hex stock when you part off hex stock you get a bunch of little kung fu stars flying around and believe me they are red hot but the initial cut is interrupted not as violently as this will be but if your machine can't handle an interrupted cut like this instead of taking it out of the machine and sawing it off by hand Leave it blank. Don't put the hole in at all. You know you're going to go to the mill to put this feature in right here, right? That little set screw hole. Grub screw. Clamp it down. 
indicate the boss, drill and ream it in the mill. Problem solved. Anyway, that's my take on it. And uh, don't be afraid to try things that scare you. And if they do scare you to the point where you don't want to try them, then don't try them. Good piece of advice for keeping all your fingers and not screwing up somebody else's machine. There you go, guys. Eccentric cap. Eccentric and the cap. Two more pieces off the list. Thanks for tuning in. Stay healthy. And the other night, one of our local newscasters made a great closing statement I thought was very appropriate for these times. She said, stay positive, test negative, and we'll see you again. And boy, I feel the same way. Take care, everybody. Thank you very much for watching Joe Pye Vance Innovations in Austin, Texas. I'm out.